Lend your ears, lend your hands, lend your movement, anything you can. Come to teach, come to be taught, come in the likeness in the image of God, cause you can be like that, with all that humbleness and all that respect. Okay, we're going to change the uh, tone a little bit through this presentation, but just to sort of pick up on some of the things that I was touching on yesterday. What you see on the screen here is the logos of the two um, weekly shows that I put out, although not while I'm here in Australia. Uh, Fracking Nightmare, we've done 40 episodes of Fracking Nightmare uh, over the past uh, 12 months, and I think 28 episodes of um, uh, Humanity versus Insanity, The Crane Report. Uh, the channel that these were originally broadcast on was effectively shut down by the British government. Um, they have a private company called Atvod, the Authority for TV and Video on Demand, and uh, they decided that uh, the channel either had to sub submit themselves to regulation, which was going to cost £250,000, or go off the air. So unfortunately, the shows disappeared for a while, but they're all back up on my YouTube channel, which is Ian R. Crane. And my last guest on uh, Humanity versus Insanity, The Crane Report, before I came out here, was this gentleman, Ken O'Keefe. Ken O'Keefe is a former US Marine. Uh, he has a Palestinian wife, and he's extremely outspoken uh, about uh, the uh, situation in the Middle East. And I believe that uh, Ken is being lined up by Mark to come out and speak at the Freedom Summits next year. And, and Ken certainly a speaker not to be missed. And um, he's become a regular on Russia Today. And I saw that two days ago, the British government are now threatening to shut down Russia Today in the UK. You know, who 30 years ago would have ever believed that we'd be tuning to a Russian TV station to get the truth? <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? You couldn't make this shit up, I tell you. <laughs> OK, let's just dispel a few myths. Um, how many people here think that we're running out of hydrocarbons? Nobody thinks we're running out of hydrocarbons? Okay, well, we might run out in about a million years. There is no shortage of hydrocarbons. The hydrocarbon industry knows exactly where the next generation of hydrocarbons is coming from. They're just going for the low-hanging fruit at the moment. Anybody got any idea when it was that Henry Ford was instructed to stop building the electric car? 1896. 1896. In the late 19th century, two-thirds of Ford's production was electric vehicles because the electric vehicle was clean, it was quiet, it was low maintenance. Obviously, it didn't have a long range, but then suburbia wasn't the sprawl that we know today. So the electric vehicles could be charged up in the home. The owner could drive the few miles into the city center and then plug it in and then drive it home again. So there was infrastructure in place in the late 19th century to recharge electric vehicles, particularly in the northeastern states and the midwestern states of the US. In the southern states, where distances were much greater, the plantations, then the internal combustion engine was the uh, vehicle of choice. And the reason that uh, Henry Ford was instructed to shut them down was because a certain individual by the name of Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, who had the monopoly on Standard Oil, instructed Ford to shut it down so that they could establish this effective monopoly on using hydrocarbons for a uh, primary fuel source. Now, doesn't it strike anybody? You look at the speed at which technology evolves you know, I mean, you know, 30 years ago, we had a house brick for a mobile phone. You know, today, we've got you know, pretty much a phone that does everything. I mean, it makes Star Trek look um, you know, Victorian. And yet, we're still relying on a technology that's about 130-odd years old for our primary means of transportation and our primary energy sources. Doesn't it strike you as pretty strange? Plus, of course, the fact that the mileage that we get, and I'm sorry, I can't think in um, litres per 100 kilometres, um, but the mileage that we get from our vehicles is very carefully controlled. The average in the UK is 35 miles per gallon. 35 miles per gallon. The average, that's the average. Some do more, some do less. Yet the technology has been around for 
at least 40 years, it's called lean burn technology, where every vehicle on the road should be returning well over 100 miles a gallon. And the construct that is created of this mythology that we're running out of hydrocarbons creates the perception of artificial scarcity, which means that on a subconscious level, then we're quite happy to pay outrageous amounts of money for fuel with little concern that the bulk of what we're paying is actually taxation. And this cartel of the motor industry, the hydrocarbons industry, the finance industry and governments all collude to keep the technology down to such a level where they are, get, they are effectively sucking our disposable income from us through taxation on fuel. And until such time as they find another way to raise taxation quite so effectively, then they will keep it where it's at. What you see on the screen here is uh, a vehicle that has been developed by uh, Volkswagen. And um, this is a, a challenge that's given to the apprentices at Volkswagen every year. And the challenge is to come up with a one litre engine that exceeds the mileage of the apprentices who designed the previous version. And they're up to 300 miles per gallon, which is three and a half litres. 300 miles per gallon. Now, when this went across to the US, the US press actually demonized it. They rubbished it because Volkswagen had claimed that they had developed a vehicle that returned 300 miles a gallon. And the American media ridiculed it because it only achieved 260 miles a gallon. <laughs> but what they conveniently forgot to mention is that whilst there are eight US pints in a, in a US gallon, there's only 16 fluid ounces in a US gallon, whereas there's 20 fluid ounces in an imperial gallon. So consequently, when you take account of the difference, the vehicle achieved exactly what the uh, manufacturers claimed, 300 miles a gallon. But again, that's how the media demonizes it. And instead of the American people going, well, that's still amazing, 260 miles a gallon, they went, see, it's just hype. <laughs> that's how conditioned we are. So, uh, yeah, this was un uh, unveiled at the uh, Qatar uh, Motor Show. But have a look at this, because this was announced in the Sunday Times about uh, two and a half months ago, I think it was. Oh, three months ago, July. There we go. The 217 mile an hour salt water powered vehicle has been approved for use on European roads. Anybody heard about this? <laughs> oh, one, a few of you. Excellent. Okay. Well, I can pretty much guarantee that you're not going to hear about it for much longer. Because once again, the cartel will find a way to effectively bury this. This is old technology. This technology is 25 years old. Anybody here heard of Stanley Myers? Yeah, well, Stanley Myers, of course, was effectively killed uh, because he refused to sell his water power vehicle technology to the US government. But here it is, it's been developed by a private company, and it's now approved for use on European roads. If you want one, unfortunately, it doesn't come cheap. At the moment, it's 1.7 million pounds, which is about 3.5 million uh, Australian. But uh, nonetheless, the technology is there. And like all technologies, it's pretty damn expensive at the start, and then it will come down as time goes on. But I can pretty much assure you this will be buried. Like EV1, anybody heard of the EV1? Yeah, a few of you. This was an electric vehicle. In fact, that's what EV stood for, Electric Vehicle One. It was developed by Chrysler in the mid-1990s. Extremely popular. It had a good range because it had new battery technology. But uh, Chrysler didn't own the uh, battery technology. So uh, Chrysler wanted to get its hands on the battery technology. So it had an arrangement with um, a Czech couple who developed the, uh, the battery technology. And uh, they were very happy to enter into a, obviously a manufacturing arrangement with uh, Chrysler. Um, but Chrysler said, look, you know, actually, we, you are uh, restricting our production capacity because what restricts us in terms of output is your ability to deliver the batteries. And they said, well, we'd like to extend, but, um, you know, we haven't got the, the funds to do that. And Chrysler said, we'll organize the funding for you. So they organized the funding. They built the factory, bought in new equipment. They're ready to up the output of the batteries. 
And just as they were ready to get go, Chrysler said, oh, how to change a plan. We're going to shut down the manufacturer of EV1. And the couple that owned the battery technology said, but hang on a second, you know, we entered an agreement and um, you know, we've built this factory, we've borrowed the money from you to uh, buy the, the plant, and now you're going to pull the plug on the project? <laughs> and Chrysler said, tell you what, we'll take it off your hands. So this is how the corporations work. You know, they want entrepreneurs. They claim they want to stimulate entrepreneurship. Well, of course they do. They want to stimulate inventors because they know they can't have the monopoly on inventions and they know a lot of people like to work independently. So they stimulate the entrepreneur on the basis that that brings the idea into the physical realm and then they'll snap it up and take control of it so that basically there's no competition. So this is what we're dealing with. And the, as for the hydrocarbons, of course, you know, where we're at right now is the low-hanging fruit is being milked, which is the coal seam gas in particular in Australia. It's a shale gas in, uh, in the US and, uh, and in the UK. And the problem with this is the legacy, as I mentioned yesterday, the legacy that it actually leaves behind. And in the US, what you see here on, in the red is all of the shale plays. And most of these shale plays were in very, very remote areas. You know, and the, the US, well, the oil and gas industry has a term for exploiting hydrocarbons in remote areas. They're called sacrifice zones. Sacrifice zones. Okay, so Queensland, particularly southern Queensland, is a sacrifice zone, as, as you'll see in a second. And they were pretty much getting away with it until they started to exploit the Marcellus shale play over here in the uh, northeast of the country, which still by European standards is very thinly populated, but by US standards is a lot more densely populated than the Midwest. And it was at this point that there was a much greater awareness of the damage that this industry was causing. And that's primarily thanks to a young farmer by the name of Josh Fox, who uh, when he was offered $100,000, by a gas company for open access onto his ranch. Uh, he decided to do a bit of research and he went across the Midwest and what he discovered absolutely shocked him. And uh, so he raised the finance to put together a documentary and that documentary is called Gaslands. Anybody here seen Gaslands? Okay, well, those of you who haven't, it is freely available on web, so just go search for it. And um, you know what's, what Josh uh, explains is occurring in the Midwest of the US is occurring just about 150 miles to the east of here. Uh, beyond uh, Toowoomba, out at Dorby, and um, out at Tar and Chinchilla. This is the area that's being exploited, much of it in southern um, Queensland. Of course, they're trying to get their bits in the ground here in uh, New South Wales. Incredibly, there is a well out in the suburbs of Sydney in Camden, and it's already being identified that there are clusters of increased illnesses particularly amongst the young children in that area. And uh, if, you, if you're not aware of that uh, drilling, just go search for the uh, unconventional gas wells, Camden, Sydney, and you can see how close some of these wells are to built up areas. And this industry knows very well the damage that they're causing elsewhere, but you know, it's, it's cognitive dissonance. They'll just shut their minds to it. But the big concern, of course, as all these gas wells are drilled, and this is, these are clusters of wells that have been drilled, because basically, because it's unconventional geology, you, you need six to eight vertical wells per square kilometer. And each of those vertical wells will have six to eight horizontal sections going off of them. So you're looking at anything between 36 and 64 wells being drilled in a square kilometer. And on the basis that you know, my own former company, Schlumberger, wrote a report about 10 years ago now, making the observation that 6% of all wells fail immediately. So if you're looking at 64 wells per square kilometer, you're looking at three to four of those wells failing immediately and leading to potential contamination. And you multiply that by the literally thousands of wells that have been drilled down the eastern seaboard here. What should be, of course, of greater concern is the fact that this spring-fed country 
is effectively being drilled out all the way down the eastern edge of the Great Artesian Basin and drilled into uh, much of the catchment areas. And in fact, literally in the last 24 hours, word has come back from um, Chinchilla that uh, the gas company there has drilled into an aquifer and there's a blowout that's blowing in to an aquifer. It's in Chinchilla, just outside Chinchilla. I'm going to go and take a look at it later this week and we'll see what's uh, actually occurring. But this is, this is horrendous. This is horrendous. But unfortunately, the gas industry in this country has got its bits in the ground and the only thing, the only thing that is going to prevent this industry from spreading further is literally one of three things. Removal of the investor will, removal of the political will, or people literally putting themselves between the trucks and the sites where they want to drill, as has happened in uh, Bentley uh, more, uh, quite recently. It's the only thing. This is one of the guys uh, from um, Gloucester a few weeks ago. He's a young man called Ned. And uh, here he is on his way to uh, the rig. And that little um, construction there came in very useful as he locked himself onto the rig for five hours. That's the kind of thing that uh, slows it down, obviously makes it more expensive for the operation. And if it's properly publicized, then obviously it helps to raise awareness. But incredibly, this information is not even being spread around the social networks in Australia. There almost seems to be some control of social networks. Brian Monk, the farmer that I'm going to go out and spend some time with later this week, has posted a number of videos over the last two years showing the devastation in his immediate area, showing the contamination of his farm, showing the gas in his water. Those videos are barely getting a few hundred views, yet they should be going viral. So what's happening here? You know, I posted a video from Gloucester, which I took, I've lost track of time now, 10 days ago, a little more, two, two weeks ago, and one of those videos has had well over 2,000 hits. The number of Brian's videos, that in some cases have been up for months, that have had more than 2,000 hits is just two or three. And those are ones that have been picked up by other people and then shown in the US and in uh, the UK. Yet they're not being spread around here in Australia. So somehow the social media is effectively being corralled to prevent the wider awareness of the magnitude of the destruction. In the local areas, you know, people are turning out at weekends, which is great. I mean, that all helps to raise the awareness. But ultimately, the industry and the politicians and the gas companies don't really give a damn about weekend protests. The purpose of a weekend protest, obviously, is to raise awareness in the local community. But in the scheme of things, the industry and the politicians don't care. It's like petitions. You know, they're a social safety valve because people think that once they've put their name on a petition or once they've turned up at a weekend rally, that's it, and I've done my bit uh, to show my opposition to this, and then it's back to the routine. This is um, a guy who was uh, taking up uh, residence at the gate of Gloucester, and uh, he looks fairly comfortable, which is just as well because... Now, this is a tactic that can be used, but here it's just a demonstration in front of the gate at the weekend when AGL aren't working. It's a demonstration. So it, it's an indication of what can be done. And certainly at Bentley, uh, there, this was used to very good effect to literally block the entrance to the well site. But this is what it's going to, to take. Much more of this. Here we've got a lock on, but again, it's a demonstration in Australia, a demonstration of what can be done. This is um, the front gate of a well site in the northwest of England. This isn't a demonstration. This is two guys who are literally cemented in to this here. And it took the police rescue team. They call them protester removal teams. It took them five hours to, uh, to cut through this. 
And then obviously they get arrested, they get charged with um, obstruction. But uh, thankfully in the UK, we have the Human Rights Act and two of the provisions of the Human Rights Act, the fundamental right to assembly and the fundamental right to peaceful protest. And under that fundamental right to peaceful protest, there is the acknowledgement that peace, peaceful protest may include such things as causing nuisance and disruption. But it's non-violent. But the British government refers to it as the hated Human Rights Act. Hated by whom? It's hated by the establishment, for sure, because it's being used to good purpose to raise awareness about the magnitude of the issues associated with this industry. And the reason that this is such a, an issue in the UK is that in a country that's one-seventh the size of Queensland, 64% of the country is currently up for grabs by the unconventional gas industry. 64%. Everything you see in brown is already licensed. Everything you see in green is right now available. Tenders closed at the end of last month on October 28th. And the Department of Energy and Climate Change are currently going through the, the adjudication process to decide you know, basically who should be awarded the licenses in these areas. If everything is actually bid and offered, then it will mean that 40 million people in the UK, two thirds of the population, will be affected by this industry. Now I'm hoping that every single square meter of land that is available is actually tendered for. Because if it's tendered for and then awarded, it means that 40 million people in the UK better start taking an interest in this industry and come to the realization of what's about to uh, descend upon them. Sadly, in Australia, literally in the last five years, Queensland has had over 4,000 wells drilled. And obviously, it's reaching the point now where Australia is looking to start to export the, the gas from these gas fields. So this industry is in for the long haul. So, you know, there's certainly the argument that says, well, it's already started, so we might as well finish. <laughs> but uh, the risk of that is that the Great Artesian Basin may not have too much life left in it. The unconventional gas industry is abstracting water from the Great Artesian Basin at a rate six times greater than it can naturally replenish. So where's the water coming from when the Great Artesian Basin is sucked dry? Hmm. It's why people need to start taking a real interest in this. The good news is that this is the AGL stock price. And um, whenever an unconventional gas company, when their stock starts to tank, then it's cause for celebration. This is um, Santos. And then this is the major company in the UK. It's called iGas. And on Fracking Nightmare, every week when the stock price goes down, I have an eyegasm. <laughs> and I offered a bottle of champagne to the investor that had lost the most as, as the stock tanked. But actually, I'd like to say that this is all due to you know, a rising public awareness. But of course, we're being seriously helped by the hawks of the US government and Saudi Arabia as they've dropped the price of a barrel of oil down to about $75 a barrel. And at that price, unconventional gas is not really viable. There's certainly not a lot of profit to be had. So that's why investors are now pulling out of the unconventional gas industry right across the world. So hopefully the Saudis, with obviously the um, persuasion of the US, I know the US are shooting themselves in the foot over this, but uh, you know, the, the hawks in the US want to hurt Russia. So their primary objective of dropping the price of a barrel of oil is to hurt Russia and Iran, but primarily Russia. But of course, they're also hurting themselves because the unconventional gas industry is not sustainable at this level. So I just wanted to bring this into play because this, for me, is a very, very serious issue. You know, Henry Kissinger said, you know, when you say control, control the, uh, the oil and you control nations, you know, control the food, you control the people control the water, and you control all life. And that's the situation that we're getting into here. And as I said yesterday, Peter Brabeck, the uh, former chief executive of Nestle, 
in an interview recorded nine years ago, stated that, in his opinion, access to fresh water should not be regarded as a human right. Homeless, me homeless people in Detroit, where uh, houses are being bulldozed to stop the homeless moving into them, and the homeless are being told, you have no human right to have access to water. You know, this is the Lang Hancock philosophy of unless you are making a direct contribution to the corporatocracy, then you have no right to life, to life itself. So this is the kind of socio-psychopathy that we're dealing with. But as I said yesterday, they are running scared. And that's why they're ramping up the game here. And that works in our favor. Have we got any Star Trek fans in the, uh, in the room? A few who admit it. You know, Gene Rodenberry never signed off on a Star Trek script unless Joseph Campbell had cast his eye over it. Everyone know who Joseph Campbell is? Quite possibly the greatest mythologist of the 20th century. So there's a lot of allegory contained within the, uh, um, the Star Trek scripts. The holodeck, of course, being one. But uh, what, is the, what is one of the unique elements of the Klingon ships. What do the Klingon ships have to do before they fire the final salvo of missiles that's going to take out their opponents? They have to uncloak, they have to decloak. They have to make themselves visible. And it's at that point that they are, of course, at their most vulnerable. So they cannot unleash the final salvo without making themselves visible to their opponents, who of course have been looking for them, they decloak, and at that moment, there's this distinct risk that they lose the battle. And that's what's going on right now. It's a great allegory for me, because that's exactly what's occurring. Because these socio-psychopaths are now revealing themselves. We look at what's going on around the world. You know, we're seeing the, the magnitude of the deceit, the corruption, the paedophilia, the militarization of the police, the dumbing down of the police. Someone was telling me, I won't tell you which state it was, but someone was telling me that a particular state in Australia, the police recruitment policy is now not to recruit anybody with an IQ over 104. <laughs> well, you know, we have, a, in, the, in the UK, uh, last winter, when we had the anti-fracking camp at Barton Moss, we came into direct contact with um, the TAU, which uh, was their tactical aid unit. Well, initially it was renamed as the tactical assault unit, and we used to call it Thugs Are Us. <laughs> and we used to joke that basically to get into Thugs Are Us, you had to you know, obviously fill in the application form, but if you could spell your name right, you were way overqualified. <laughs> And this is where we're getting to. It's the same in the corporate world. You know, 30 years ago, you were trying, we were all trying to recruit people that were able to demonstrate capacity for independent thought and for initiative. But today, no. Anybody who shows any capacity and capability for independent thought is almost unemployable. You've got to follow the script. You've got to, you know, computers say no. Computers say no. You know, just follow the scripts. So it's becoming more and more obvious, and I know it's very frustrating for everybody, because we can all see it. That's why you're here. We can all see what's going on. And you think, for fuck's sake, how come nobody can see it? Oh, my God. You know, you can't see 9-11, Bali, 7-7, how many? But yeah, they can't see it. And it doesn't matter how much evidence you put in front of them. If they can't see it, they can't see it. So all we can do is sow seeds. And sowing seeds is so, so, so important. And it's a very powerful technique. And think of what happens when you sow the seed. You know, you've got a grow bag. Romans, of course, got thousands of grow bags. But <laughs> <laughs> you put a seed in there. And if you put the seed in there and you say, OK, there's the seed, come on. Oh, I've got the water. You get the water, pour the water on, kick the soil over it, say, oh, come on. Come on, come on. Fucking seeds. Kick some more soil over it, put some more water on it. Come on. 
get the lights turned up, kick some more soil over it, pour some more water. What's going to happen to the seed? You're going to kill it. It's dead. You've got to sow the seed and then walk away. Just leave it. Because then it'll germinate in its own time. You don't know exactly when it's going to germinate, but it will germinate in its own time. And then from that, a little shoot will appear. And then from that shoot, you get the plant. Well, it's the same when you're sowing seeds about the information that we've been sharing around it this weekend. If people don't want to hear it, there's no point in keep thrusting it down their throat. They're just not ready for it. So you sow the seed. And of course, when they come back a few months later and say, oh my God, did you know, did you know that 9-11 wasn't perpetrated by 19 Muslims? <laughs> Your challenge is not to go, fucking told you that. <laughs> Your challenge is to go, oh, really? <laughs> and what else? What else? A couple of years ago, three years ago, there was a guy in the UK. He was the third most senior criminal analyst, criminal intelligence analyst in the country. His name was Tony Farrell. Is Tony Farrell. And he was asked by his employer, the South Yorkshire Police Force, to do an investigation into the terror threat from the local Muslim community. And he'd never looked at any of these issues before. I mean, his responsibility was criminal intelligence. You know, looking at the likelihood of crime based on statistics in a particular area, looking at the resources needed, human resources, <laughs> needed to address the crime that might manifest in that area based on statistics. So Tony said, yeah, OK, I'll take a look at that. Anyway, started to look at the threat of terror. And of course, a good point to start was the London bombings. And the more he looked at it, the more he realized that the London bombings were a construct. The more he looked at it, the more he realized that the only people who had the resources to pull off something like this were the British intelligence services. So he's like, oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, my own government is perpetrating this kind of bullshit. Anyway, he's a Christian, so he went to his uh, local priest, said, I need to talk to you. I really, we need to sit down and have a chat. And uh, so he explained the situation to his uh, priest, and his priest sat there and then said, um, mm, bit of a dilemma, eh, Tony? Have you looked at 9-11? <laughs> and Tony went, what? 9-11? No, surely not. Priest said, no, don't take it from me. Go take a look. Tony went and looked at 9-11. Uh, he went, oh, my God. So Tony compiled a report, uh, compiled a report and uh, submitted it to his bosses. Unfortunately, the front cover was rather graphic, and it pretty much gave away what was probably in the report. So he handed it to his boss, and his boss said, I'm not reading that. <laughs> I'm not reading that. Tony said, how can you not read it? You asked me to do an analysis on the likely terror threat, and, which I've done, and... Um, here it is. And the guy said, yeah, but I think I know what's in it. He said, yeah, but you only think, you don't know. And the guy said, well, yeah, yeah, I think I know what's in it. Am I wrong? Tony said, I'm, I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> so he took it to his boss's boss. And his boss's boss said, um, Tony, huh, I'm not reading that report. Anyway, Tony was put on gardening leave. And then he had his employment terminated. So here was the third most senior criminal intelligence analyst in the UK with 20 years service in the police force, and now he's been fired for producing a report that nobody's read. <laughs> well, you know, you got to love the way the universe works. I was actually giving a presentation. I was scheduled to give a presentation in Sheffield, his hometown, two days before his employment tribunal hearing. I'd never met Tony. I'd heard about the case, but I'd never met him. He came along to the presentation that evening, and unfortunately, we didn't get too much of an opportunity to speak, but um, at the end of the evening, he came up and he said, look, I'm going to have a, a meeting with a few friends tomorrow to talk about you know, how I'm going to represent or present my case at the employment tribunal. I went along to the, to the meeting and, uh, with him the following night, and uh, there was another academic there. And uh, you know, as we were listening to... Tony outlined his case, and of course he's very emotive. 
I said, Tony, you know, it's a real problem when you're trying to represent yourself because the moment that you become emotional, you will actually lose the, uh, the confidence of the court that you are presenting the case rationally. He said, you really need to get yourself a lawyer. He said, no, I just can't afford one. So, you know, I said, that's not good. And I went to, back to my hotel, and um, when I woke up in the morning, I thought, you know, we've really got to help Tony here. So when I saw him at breakfast, I said, look, here's an offer. You don't have to take me up on it, but if you like, I'll represent you at the tribunal. Expecting him to say, no, that's okay, Ian. I'm quite happy to do it myself. Unfortunately, he said, oh, that's great. <laughs> so I literally picked up the bundle, and it's like this thick. We went into the tribunal, and the judge said, um, now, how much time do we need to uh, prepare? Because he said, we haven't had a chance to read the bundles yet. How much of it do we need to read? And I said, all of it. All of it. And the judge said, really? I said, yep, all of it. Because I hadn't read anything, so I needed the time. <laughs> anyway, I, it was easy. It was real easy because, basically, I simply got all of their witnesses to admit that they hadn't read the report. So my case was, how can you fire a guy with an exemplary record? I mean, all his past performance appraisals, the, you know, the report was well above normal expectancy or outstanding, and now you're firing a guy because of what you think is in a report. So it should have been cut and dried. Anyway, um, we went through a, a two-day hearing, and on the third day, uh, at lunch, the judge said, okay, we're going to retire. It's a panel of three. He said, we're going to retire. Uh, we're going to retire for uh, lunch plus an hour. you will be back here at uh, 2 o'clock. And when we came back at 2 o'clock, the judge then read out his summary, which took him an hour and a half to read. And Tony could see that I was getting more and more frustrated because the summary that was being read was as though it was another case because it wasn't taking account of anything that had happened in the past two days. So here was the establishment. I mean, the, the tribunal ruled that Tony was um, fired legitimately. And uh, so he's now obviously trying to challenge that in the high court, but it's, it's very difficult. But this is the level of cognitive dissonance that we're up against. Tony Farrell had his worldview rocked just three years ago when he first looked at this. So here's a very, very smart guy locked into his very myopic worldview because that's what he's effectively needs to do to be able to function in his job as criminal intelligence analyst. The reality is, even if he did get reinstated, he couldn't go back and do that job anymore. Okay. Mark's telling me that I've got about five minutes. Ten. Ten minutes. Fifty. <laughs> right, luxury. Okay, I just want to share this with you quickly. Okay, in fact, I want to share everything with you quickly. <laughs> Yesterday I said that, you know, basically they're trying to ramp up the speed with which they shut us down, with which they lure us into the mainframe. This is actually the um, promo for the film Transcendence. Anybody seen Transcendence? Yeah, yeah, if you haven't seen Transcendence, I would actually recommend that you do watch it. And Lucy. There's a bunch of films coming out right now which are sowing the memes. And of course, Hollywood puts out the memes to literally try and sow the seeds so that what is currently regarded as unimaginable and unthinkable over a few years then becomes accepted. And a classic is kids killing kids, children killing children, which 30 years ago would have been absolutely an absolute anathema. It just wouldn't have been tolerated in any way, shape or form. Now, of course, we have the Hunger Games, and kids go along to see the film, The Hunger Games, and kids killing kids. It's making it acceptable. One of the uh, futurist think tanks convened earlier this year to look at words that would disappear from the English language. And they came up with a few interesting words. I mean, obvious ones like cigarette. But there are two words that they identified as disappearing from the English language within a generation, or maybe two at the most, which are extremely concerning. And that's mum and dad. You know, this is the breakup of the family unit. And then just two days ago, in the uh, Daily Mail, which is a British newspaper, but it was published on the Australian 
uh, uh, website for the Daily Mail, there was an article which was discussing the increase of the use of cybernetics of effectively androids in life. And in fact, in Japan, they've, I wouldn't say perfected, but they've reached the point of development where they are using these humanoid androids in jobs like um, reception and newsreaders. I thought newsreaders were already androids, but <laughs> apparently not. And this is the article. It says, the hyper-real robots that will replace receptionist pop stars and even sex dolls, unnerving human androids coming to a future near you. Let's jump to the very bottom comment here. Scientists, futurists, are even talking about humans taking androids as partners. And this is the, one of the pictures that was uh, produced in this article. The, apparently, the uh, sex dolls uh, that um, are manufactured in Japan are extremely lifelike. The skin texture is very real. And now they're looking at, within probably a few years, developing android sex dolls. <laughs> I'll give you the website later. <laughs> says it's not inconceivable says an Orient Industry spokesman, that we will be making Android life partners in the near future. David Levy, author of Love and Sex with Robots, predicts that as robots become more sophisticated, growing numbers of adventurous humans will enter into intimate relationships with these intelligent robots. Now, I must confess... <laughs> no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> But it gets worse because there are futurists that are now setting up think tanks to establish equal rights for anthropomorphic automatons. You know, now this, may, this might seem quite benign when you're talking about this kind of auto automaton, perhaps. But then we get into this. And let me tell you that the military are a long way ahead a long, long, long way ahead of what is being now put into the public domain about life partners as androids. But of course, the purpose here is literally to dehumanize people, to convince them that you, know, you don't need any human interaction because it's actually far more enjoyable to have interaction with um, a programmable android. Unbelievable. Well, I said yesterday that I would share with you where this comes from. And actually, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want to get into some other stuff. But um, if you want to look at the agenda that's unfolding here, look no further than a document that was published in 1932 called Technocracy Inc. These are the two guys that produced it. Some of you may have heard of Marion King Hubbard. Anybody heard of Marion King Hubbard? Yeah, and you would have heard of him, of course, because he was the guy who first put the whole hypothesis of peak oil into the public domain in 1957 at um, uh, Petroleum Engineers event in Austin, Texas. But this was his mentor, Howard Scott. Um, this guy, by the way, went straight on to uh, be a member of the Club of Rome. But in Technocracy Inc., they are talking about the control of humanity. And this, is, this was basically their, um, their rules of engagement. You know, register on a 24-hour basis the total net conversion of energy by means of the registration of energy converted and consumed to make possible a balanced load, provide a continuous inventory of all production and consumption, provide a specific registration of the type, kind of all goods and services where produced and where used, provide a specific registration of the consumption of each individual plus a record and description of that individual. And there basically, they were putting forward the very early hypothesis that unless you are contributing to their balanced, resource-based economy, you have no right to the basics of life. It's all out there. You know, you've got to know what you, well, you've got to have an idea of what you're looking for, but um, unfortunately, the vast majority of people don't have the time, even if they have the inclination, because they're kept running on the treadmill. And what the establishment is trying to do 
is basically keep people locked into their left brain. The left brain, which an increasing number of neuroanatomists and neurosurgeons are beginning to recognize is not a single organ. It's at least two organs separated by the corpus callosum. The left brain is the transmitter receiver that effectively connects us with this physical, empirical, material realm in a very, very narrow bandwidth, a narrow bandwidth of all the senses. Very narrow visual bandwidth, very narrow oral bandwidth. There's so much more out there. We may catch glimpses of what the right brain is capable of, but we're not allowed to dwell on it. So how many people here have had an experience that they can't explain? I'd be surprised if there were too many that haven't. Yeah. And generally, of course, we don't normally talk about them for fear of being labelled as crazy. And you certainly don't talk to your doctor about it, because otherwise you're going to find that you're on medication fairly quickly. But the reality is more and more people are experiencing things that they just can't explain, but neither can they deny. And the good news is that more and more people are starting to talk about them. More and more people are starting to write books about them. This is a, an incredible book. Some of you may have heard me tell this story before about how this book came into my life. Uh, basically, I was talking to my son about this book and how I'd love to lay my hands on a copy of this book, especially a first edition. And uh, we were literally traveling in Central America and uh, we went into a pizza restaurant in Copan. I didn't even want pizza, but my son wanted pizza. And when I went to the book exchange in the corner there, this book was right in the middle of the bookshelf. And I'd been talking about this book for the previous two days. And then my son said, yeah, but you must have put it there. <laughs> well, eventually he acknowledged that I hadn't put it there. Um, <laughs> and we talked about the whole process. And then he started to share some of the experiences that, uh, that he had had. I showed you this yesterday. You know, the graphic where the baby is the only one that is a normal shaped head here. All the rest are blockheads. What is being intimated in this artwork is that by the time the humans get to young adulthood, then they have to be turned into blockheads, controlled by the system. So let's have a look at some of these things, uh, this bio-spiritual warfare that's going on. And I know every one of you here will probably be aware of these, but you know, what are we doing about it? Number one, of course, is the vaccinations. You know, you know that now in the US, if you die within 48 hours of having a vaccination, it was nothing to do with the vaccination. And they've just introduced the same in the UK. You know, Rudolf Steiner, 100 years ago, said a way will finally be found to vaccinate bodies so that these bodies will not allow the inclination towards spiritual ideas to develop. And all their lives, people will believe only in the physical world they perceive with their senses. Of course, the word spiritual here is simply being used as a catch-all term to cover anything that can't be explained by physical, empirical, material, Newtonian terminology. You know, on top of that, of course, we've got the Ritalin, you know, the Kitty Coke. Ritalin. In the UK now, doctors are being encouraged to prescribe Ritalin, particularly to the children of teen mothers from the Sink Estates. And in the UK, doctors are, or not doctors, but the state is offering £600 per month to a mother who has a child diagnosed ADHD and prescribed a course of Ritalin. Two children, £1,200. Three children, they're now classed as a super carer, so they get £1,800, £600 for each kid. So £1,800, that's about 3500 Australian. And they're provided with a free car. Taxed, insured, and fuel provided because they're a super carer and they need the car to be able to get the kids around. Well, word, of course, goes around the sink estates because you've got this dichotomy right now where the average age at which a woman is having her first child is in their mid-late 30s in all Western nations. Two reasons, one is economic, the other one is the incredible drop in fertility, particularly male fertility. And a big part of this is linked to guys carrying their mobile phones around in their pockets. <laughs> if you don't want kids, it's a cheap form of um, contraception, I suppose. So we have the falling birth rate. The, the most amount of money 
spent on non-essential medical treatment in the Western world is on fertility treatments. So this drug, which has a very similar chemical structure to cocaine and um, crystal meth, in fact, even pharmacologists don't really understand how it works because it seems to have a very different effect on the developed brain, where it acts as a stimulant, than it does on the developing brain, where it acts as a suppressant. And um, i just introduce you to this. This is a website, SSRI Stories. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, the term for antidepressants. And on this website, there is a remarkable database of very unfortunate incidents ranging from suicide to homicide, self-harming, that are directly associated with this drug. Now, the doctors were beginning to suspect that a lot of the women who were being prescribed, or the children who were being prescribed this drug, were not being given the drug because the mothers were selling the drug. So they were getting the drugs, they were seeking the benefits, but then they were selling the drugs in schools uh, sorry, in, in colleges and universities, where it is sought as the drug of choice for parties and studying. And this is in Australia, by the way, but it's the same in the UK. It's the same in the UK. So now, when the, um, when the kids go to, back to the doctor, the doctors are required to give the kids a urine test before they issue another prescription to make sure the kids are taking these drugs. So there's a hell of a lot that we can do about it. You know, we can actually effectively not participate, you know, by not using allopathic medicines unless absolutely essential. We'll spend some time and do a bit of research rather than just rushing down to the doctor. We've got the other threat, of course, of the, uh, the foods. In the US, they can now classify a food as organic with 10% contamination. In Europe, it's 0.17%. And the whole purpose of TTIP and TTP is to harmonize, and you harmonize with the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator right now is basically the US. You know, obviously, we have uh, the TV. You know, and in Australia, what is it, three and a half hours average? The US, of course, eight plus. But, you know, get away from the TVs. Get the kids away from mobile phones. Stay indoors. <laughs> Particularly in Perth, where they're spraying at night now. Uh, when I was in Perth, I was staying with a doctor there. He told me that uh, when you do a hair analysis of people who live in Perth, the barium content is higher, much higher than those of people who live out in the boonies. You know, you've just heard AB talking about uh, the fluoride, fluoride in the water, where well, they're now looking to up the game in Ireland by adding lithium. Uh, you see here, at the bottom here, it says lithium is also used as a neurological drug for mood stabilization. You know, the establishment are exposing themselves. They're desperate to keep people locked in to the left brain. But, uh, you know, four years ago, I spent some time with these wonderful people, the Quero, in Peru, and these people had been lost to the world for 400 years because they'd been chased up into the high Andes. And uh, one aspect of the wisdom that they shared with me when I was there in, uh, in May of 2010 was that you know, everything that is occurring right now is aimed at bringing people to a new level, a new level of consciousness. There's something happening which will aid that process that is external, but we can also contribute to this process by trying to effectively step away from the construct that's being created by those who think they are the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom. This is the outside help that they say we are getting, significant in terms of helping us re reawaken what uh, has been termed as uh, junk DNA. But there's something else that these guys shared and what they said was that to bring about the change, we have to participate in two ways. And we have to participate in both of these. We can't do one without the other. Or we might, but it's not going to achieve the same impact. Their observation is that the, to bring about the change, we must visualize, we must take some time to visualize 
the future that we want to see, the legacy that we really want to leave for future generations. But whilst we're visualizing that, we shouldn't restrict ourselves. We shouldn't limit that visualization, because if we limit that visualization, we may actually be limiting what can ultimately manifest. Whereas what can ultimately manifest right now may be way beyond our bounds of perception. So we have to leave it open to something maybe even more magical. But the other thing that we have to do is we have to participate in trying to bring about the change. And as I said yesterday, there's so many things that we can pick up on. You know, whether it is the geoengineering, whether it's the GM foods, whether it's the fluoridation in the water, and the lithium, God forbid, whether it's the immunization, whether it's the use of Wi-Fi in schools. In my opinion, all schools should be hardwired. I'm not saying do away with the computers, but hardwire them. Don't flood the kids with Wi-Fi. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do, and we need people to pick up on all these things. Smart meters coming in at a phenomenal rate. If something is, is labelled as smart, ask the question, who's it smart for? Because it ain't going to be smart for you. So these are the two things that you know, we have to, or the Quero certainly suggests that we should do. And the other aspect of this, as Rudolf Steiner made the observation 100 years ago again, he said, he who would create the new must be able to endure the passing of the old in full tranquility. You know, I hear people talking about, you know, saying, well, you know, we have, to, we have to just live without any possessions. No, we don't. We have to live without any attachment to possessions. There's no problem in having possessions. We've all got to live, and we want to live comfortably to be able to do what we do. It's the attachment that's the problem. And if you've got an attachment to something, the universe has a very interesting way of showing you how to lose that attachment. <laughs> it takes them away from you when you least expect it. So... Every one of you is here because you know that something is happening. And the establishment know that something is happening. And the problem is, they don't know how to stop this rising tide of awareness. You know, it's a big new Brzezinski, who's Obama's mentor. He made the observation a few years ago. He said, it's easier to kill a million people than it is to control them. And that might just be a little bit too obvious. I mean, they're doing it in some parts of the world. But you know... We do have an absolutely tremendous opportunity to reach the next level. I thought I was being smart <laughs> when I came up with the term a few years ago, homo luminous. But I've, I've actually learned I don't have an original idea in my head. Because if I think that I might have had an original idea, it only takes about three and a half nanoseconds to go on a search engine and find that somebody else said the idea long before me. And in fact, that's how I got to Peru. Because when I came up with the term homo luminous, I thought, no, 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 <laughs> somebody else has come up with that one. And I discovered a guy called Alberto Villoldo. And then it was reading some of Alberto Villoldo's books that uh, led ultimately to me going to Peru. You know, we're all in this together. You know, there's, there's a lot of spiritual narcissism out there. And, you know, just, just walk away, just steer clear of that. Our challenge is to try to encourage people to see for themselves. You cannot tell anybody the truth. People have to come to their own realization of what truth is. I love that term, real eyes -ation. Come to your own determination of what it's all about. You know, I am very optimistic. I actually have great faith in humanity. Yes, it gets frustrating at times. I'd be a liar if I didn't say I have the old fuck moment every now and again. But ultimately, what I see is humanity striving to bring about the changes that we all know we need to see. We're looking for that breakthrough. Well, what we got to do, and this is the part of the Quero wisdom, if we keep making the effort to bring about the changes, if we visualize the type of changes that we need to see, then that change will come. And it will come in ways that we least expect. It will come out of left field. You know, I have this vision of the celestial scriptwriters sitting around the table, sort of working out the script of what's going to unfold. And every time we think of what's going to bring that change about, they go, oh, shit, that's another one off the list. Because they have to come up with something we haven't thought of. And it will come. It will come. And our challenge is to embrace that change. Not to be frightened of it. Not to be fearful. Not to panic. But as Steiner said, he who wants to embrace the new must be prepared to release the old. 
release the attachment to everything and just allow yourselves to surrender to what's going to unfold here. But contribute. Make an active effort to contribute. Many of you, perhaps all of you, already are. But just look at how you can take it to another level. And never underestimate the power of an individual contribution because although we may think individually we can't actually do very much, but our individual contribution is part of the collective. And collectively, we are so awesome that those who think the right, they're the rightful ruler of a planet, planetary fiefdom are running scared. So thanks for sharing the time with me. And I'm going to leave you with a quote that's my, one of my favorite quotes. And this quote does not come from Russell Crowe. <laughs> the scriptwriters of Gladiator had obviously read the works of Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius made this observation. He said, what we do in life ripples through eternity. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. What, a, what an amazing speaker. I could listen to Ian all day, <clears throat> all day and all night. Thank you very much, mate. Can you guys